towards the end of the last chapter, we started to look at some reactions we could do uh, with aromatic compounds. Now, uh, we noticed that uh, it's really difficult to do reactions on the benzene ring itself. Uh, so instead, we started looking at reactions at the benzylic position, for example, and, and things just off of our aromatic rings. In this chapter, we are going to look at reactions on our benzene ring, uh, specifically what we call aromatic substitution reactions, uh, where we substitute one of the hydrogens on, of our, uh, on our benzene ring with some other functional group. All right. so just to reiterate, uh, while you would normally expect an alkene to be relatively reactive, uh, and even though a benzene ring has three carbon-carbon double bonds, we don't see the kind of reactivity that we normally would expect. So for example, uh, one of the standard tests for an alkene is to add bromine to it, and you'll notice that reddish-brown color of bromine disappearing really rapidly. All right, that, that's usually a, a very quick, easy test for the presence of an alkene. Despite the fact that uh, benzene has three carbon-carbon double bonds, there's actually no reaction with bromine. We, we don't see that same addition product uh, that we would normally see with cyclohexene, for example. All right, so uh, the reason for this, of course, as we saw in the last chapter, is the unusual stability of these aromatic systems, right? They, they really want to stay in those aromatic, uh, as those aromatic rings, and uh, doing that addition reaction across one of those double bonds would take that ring out of that stability. Okay, and that's why it's just not energetically favorable. Okay, so while we can't do a halogenation reaction, we can make the dibromo product across one of the double bonds, if we add in some iron, we can swap out one of the hydrogens on our benzene for a bromine. Okay, so please note that the reaction at the top there, where we add bromine, a bromine molecule across the double bond to make that dibromo product, uh, that's a an addition reaction, right? We're adding across a double bond, but notice that in the reaction with uh, using iron, we still have our benzene ring, right? We still have our uh, conjugated pi system uh, around those six carbon atoms in the ring of our benzene, notice that the hydrogen that's not shown is swapped out for one bromine atom. Okay, so please keep in mind that this is a substitution reaction. All right, so we're substituting the hydrogen for a bromine. Okay, now that being said, even though I use the word substitution, uh, you can already tell it's probably not going to be your typical SN1 or SN2 mechanism. Uh, we've already seen uh, back in the chapter last semester on substitution reactions uh, that, you know, sp2 hybridized carbons aren't really good for forming carbocations. Okay, so, so it's not going to be your typical substitution. Anyway, that's, this type of reaction is what we're going to look at in this chapter. This is what we call an electrophilic aromatic substitution, or EAS reaction. All right, so uh, in all of these examples, we're going to swap out a hydrogen on our benzene ring for some other group. Uh, we just saw an example with a bromine. Uh, we can swap it out for a chlorine, for a nitro group, uh, for a sulfate group, um, for an alkyl group, or even a ketone group. All right, so keep in mind that these aromatic rings with you know their three pi bonds in the in amongst six carbons are very electron rich. All right, uh, so basically that ring is going to act as a nucleophile. Right, so uh, you have things that are going to attack that benzene that are going to be electrophilic. They're going to seek out that extra electron density on your benzene ring, hence electrophilic aromatic substitution. All right, so how does iron help this reaction happen? Well, so first of all, the iron reacts with bromine to make iron 3 bromide. All right, so we have this iron bromine complex, uh, which then picks up an extra bromine uh, molecule, right? Now, when it does this, uh, it actually 
gets a bromonium ion to break off and create this iron bromine complex over here, uh, this iron tetrabromide complex. So we have a positively charged bromine ion or uh, a bromonium cation. Now, we since uh, this has a positive charge, this is going to be electrophilic. Okay, again, hence the name, right? We want something electrophilic to seek out that electron-rich benzene ring. All right, so so that's kind of what happens basically. So that uh, your your benzene uh, basically does a nucleophilic attack and picks up that bromonium ion, and in doing so, now uh, it makes what we call a sigma complex. So we have. Uh, a positive charge, we have a carbocation here, and it's going to be resonance stabilized by that ring. So we have this double bond moving over here, which would shift the, the positive charge over here. Uh, we could then have that this double bond move over and basically have that positive charge shift around the ring accordingly. All right, so, so even though we have a carbocation here, that carbocation is resonance stabilized, and so this sigma complex is a pretty stable um, you know, pretty stable intermediate. Oh, a uh, quick note here about uh, iron bromide. We can also use aluminum bromide too sometimes. All right, so uh, here's a picture of the uh, of our sigma complex, and you can see again how that resonance stabilization spreads that positive charge around the ring, and therefore makes that sigma complex relatively stable. Here's a picture of the hybrid structure showing how that positive charge is is partially spread out throughout the whole ring. Okay, so what do we do to make the stable product? Well, uh, notice that now this carbon over here, which is sp3 hybridized, can just have a proton transfer occur, and you basically restore aromaticity to the ring. Okay, so again, uh, this intermediate, while it's resin stabilized, is still an intermediate, not you know super stable, uh, it'll go towards this more stable product relatively quickly and easily. Okay, um, yeah, and so you lose HBr as a byproduct basically, right? So that that uh, extra bromine that was on your iron center uh, picks up that proton and leaves as HBr. Uh, notice that you restore your iron 3 bromide. Uh, so basically iron 3 bromide is a catalyst here. Okay. So here's the uh, energy profile of that uh, of the mechanism. All right, so you can see how uh, basically by restoring aromaticity, this product is very thermodynamically stable. Okay, it makes way more sense uh, to have this product form than this addition product. Right, so notice that since your addition product uh, takes your molecule out of aromaticity, the energy, the potential energy of that product is way higher than. Uh, the original reactant. All right, so there's a, so definitely that's a very endothermic reaction. All right. So I mentioned earlier that uh, in addition to a bromo product, we can also make a chloro product. Uh, so if we use aluminium chloride uh, instead of iron three bromide uh, and uh, chlorine instead of bromine we can swap out a chlorine atom for a hydrogen. Again, very similar mechanism as we just saw with bromine. Uh, of course, instead we here we have uh, chlorine instead of bromines and we have an aluminum center instead of a an iron center. All right, and uh, yeah, and then we get the chloro substituted product and HCl is a byproduct. And of course, uh, the aluminum chloride is uh, catalytic here. All right, uh, so regarding uh, the other halogens, uh, Fluorine and iodine aren't really practical for this kind of substitution reaction uh, for opposite re uh, reasons. Uh, fluorine is just, you know, that reaction just happens a little too violently to make it very controllable and very practical. Um, and with iodine, it's generally too slow and uh, too low yielding. Okay. So again, if you want to see that whole mechanism, note the similarities here between um, you know our aluminum chloride uh, you know reaction with chlorine uh, as compared to the iron three bromide and bromine reaction we saw previously. So again, you form a complex uh, with your aluminum, and uh, your your benzene picks up that positive, partially positively charged chlorine. 
Um, and it uh, basically forms that sigma complex, which, as we see again, is resonance stabilized. And of course, then, uh, you know, that complex can then pluck off a proton from that same carbon, thus restoring aromaticity. Next up, we have sulfonation. So here we take our benzene reacted with what's called fuming sulfuric acid, which is basically sulfuric acid mixed with sulfur trioxide. Um, and we get this sulfonic acid group here. Um, I may have accidentally referred to this as sulfonate um, you know, in an earlier slide. Uh, just a quick note here. Uh, when this is protonated, it's called a sulfonic acid. When it's deprotonated, so we have an ion here, then it's the sulfonate ion. Okay, so, uh, but anyway, here we have a sulfonic acid. All right, now how does this work? Uh, again, we need a really strong electrophile here to attack our benzene ring or have our benzene ring do a nucleophilic attack to it. Uh, and here our electrophile is sulfur trioxide. Uh, we have our big squishy sulfur in the middle and it has three oxygens uh, double bonded to it, very electronegative oxygens that are sucking electron density away from that sulfur, uh, and so that allows that, uh, you know, that kind of uh, deprives that sulfur of some electron density, okay? Uh, the other thing that's really useful here is that uh, because sulfur and oxygen are from different periods, uh, their p orbitals, uh, their, well, unhybridized p orbitals when they're sp2 hybridized, are not the same type of p orbitals. We're talking about 2p in oxygen versus 3p in sulfur. So we have different sized p orbitals and therefore they don't overlap perfectly. So even though you have a lateral overlap forming those pi bonds, it's not the best lateral overlap. All right, so, uh, so basically instead of having a good, you know, strong double bond between that sulfur and oxygen, uh, it kind of has more of a single bond character to it. Character to it. Uh, and as such, if, if you look at the formal charges involved there, again, remember, those oxygens are more electronegative. So uh, we've got close to a formal charge on that sulfur, okay, instead of it having a, a nice complete double bond on it. Okay, so having that, that partial positive charge on there, uh, allows again a nucleophilic attack from that benzene ring okay just like we saw in our previous uh, example with halogenations all right so uh, so again we have our you know we can draw a curly arrow going from our double bond to that sulfur um, and here we can see the sigma complex that's formed accordingly okay so we have a sulfonate group uh, attached to our sigma complex and and again this is resonance stabilized this is going to be stable uh, you know, much a pretty stable carbocation because of that resonance stabilization that we saw earlier. Okay, so again, here are all the resonance structures and here's that hybrid showing that. All right, um, and then as before, you can have some base come along, pluck off that proton, restore aromaticity. Uh, notice that the product you have here is your uh, sulf uh, sulfonate group. Uh, so if you protonate that, then you get the, the corresponding sulfonic acid, okay? Uh, protonating it isn't a problem. Keep in mind, this is being done in the presence of sulfuric acid. You have a pretty acidic solution. This is going to be driven towards that uh, protonated product. All right. So, so that actually is what drives uh, this reaction towards uh, your product. Uh, it actually turns out that if you use dilute sulfuric acid, uh, the equilibrium is kind of shifted back towards the original benzene reactant. Uh, so having a concentrated fuming sulfuric acid uh, is what drives us towards that sulfonic acid product. Okay. Um, consider the reversibility of this product uh, of this reaction. Uh, we're going to take advantage of that later on in this chapter. It's going to come in handy from a synthetic standpoint. Uh, when we start looking at protecting groups. All right, anyway, more on that later on in this chapter. All right, next up we have nitration. So here we're adding on a nitro group that's just an NO2 group. Um, the reagents we're going to use here are concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid. All right, so our sulfuric acid here is a proton source um, and it converts our nitric acid into the nitronium ion. 
All right, so, so basically we protonate uh, the OH group on our nitric acid. Uh, it leaves as a water molecule, and you are left with this nitronium ion. And notice the similarities between our nitronium and our sulfur trioxide in the previous example with sulfonation. Notice that we, again, have an atom here in the middle connected to oxygens, um, and you know, therefore, you know, you have these electronegative oxygens pulling electron density away from the central atom. Um, in the case of nitrogen here, of course, we we do have a formal positive charge, uh, so that definitely helps. Um, you know, this is positively charged. This is you know going to really readily uh, you know seek that electron-rich uh, benzene ring. All right, so again, very similar mechanism. Uh, you're probably seeing a pattern here, right? We have uh, our, our arrow going from one of our double bonds to that nitrogen. We form our sigma complex, which again is going to be resonance stabilized. To, uh, that's why this is a good intermediate. All right, again, showing what that stabilization looks like. Uh, and then, of course, you have a base come along and a pluck off a proton, restoring aromaticity, and there's your nice neutral product. Okay, now the nitro group from a synthetic standpoint is pretty useful, all right? Where we're going to, uh, you know, obviously there there are molecules, uh, you know, products out there that, you know, where we want to have a nitro group. But one extra synthetic utility here is that we can convert a nitro group uh, into an amine. Uh, we can basically do a reduction using either iron or zinc uh, and hydrochloric acid, and our nitro group gets converted into an amino group pretty, uh, you know, pretty well actually okay so so that's something to keep in mind uh, for any synthetic problems that require you to tack on an amine uh, to your benzene ring uh, realize that you can do so in two steps in your first step make your nitro uh, benzene using concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid and the next step use either zinc or iron and HCl and you will reduce that to the corresponding amine in the previous chapter, we uh, looked at some reactions at the benzylic position on, um, you know, on a benzene ring with an alkyl substituent, um, but we didn't actually see how we added those alkyl substituents in the first place. And I think I may have alluded back then to the Friedel-Crafts alkylation reaction. Um, so basically, uh, we are doing. You could kind of think of this as a nucleophilic substitution on an alkyl halide, which we've already seen last semester in your, in your typical nucleophilic substitution reactions. Uh, that being said, um, in this sense, I don't think the uh, alkyl halide's a strong enough electrophile to, to encourage this EAS reaction. Um, and so you have to uh, kind of encourage it by introducing a catalyst. And in this case, the catalyst uh, that we use is actually a Lewis acid. All right, so we're going to use aluminum chloride in addition to our alkyl halide, uh, and that helps sort of prime our alkyl halide for this substitution reaction. Okay, so basically, uh, what happens is our uh, the halogen on our alkyl halide uh, attaches to our aluminum center and our aluminum chloride. Okay, uh, which essentially sort of plucks off that halogen, uh, you know, making the, our aluminum complex here and a carbocation. Now we have a formal positive charge on that carbon, and therefore this is going to be much, much more effective for our EAS reaction, right? This is going to be a much stronger electrophile um, uh, rather than just having the partial positive charge that we would have had just from that chlorine alone. Okay, so. Uh, so, of course, this then uh, attacks our ring, uh, or the ring attacks that, I guess, if you draw the arrow going that way. Um, and you have a sigma complex again, just like before. Okay. So, now that being said, you've got to be careful about the types of alkyl halides that you want to make here. Um, you, I don't know if you noticed in that last example, but that was a secondary alkyl halide that we used. All right. What happens if you use a primary alkyl halide? Well, 
you're not going to go through a primary carbocation intermediate. Uh, the reason for this is that that carbocation is going to undergo a rearrangement, which will then produce a secondary carbocation, or tertiary, depending on the shape of it. Um, and therefore, that's going to be your major product. That, that secondary carbocation is more stable and therefore will yield your major product. Okay, so if you're trying to get the um, you know a primary alkyl substituent here, uh, you can't do it directly under Friedel-Crafts conditions. All right, so uh, there is a way to do it. We'll get to it in a second, but uh, understand that when you're planning out these types of syntheses, uh, watch out for this pitfall. This is a common wrong answer you're going to see on multiple choice uh, questions. So it, it's, you know, just be ready for that type of question is what I'm getting at. Okay, so, um, so basically, uh, you can see here that uh, we have, you know, instead of breaking off and forming that primary carbocation, you can see even in that coordinated step with our Lewis acid complex, uh, we can have our hydride shift right there itself to make the more stable secondary carbocation. Okay. All right. So here's the uh, the full mechanism showing uh, how it yields that major product. Uh, again, it's the same as before. You you have your benzene, uh, you know, attacking that carbocation. You make your sigma complex. Uh, you know your um, aluminum complex comes along and plucks off that proton. It acts as that base there to pluck off that proton, restoring aromaticity and your product. But but the key thing here again is that even though you started off with an al a primary alkyl halide, you wind up with a secondary uh, you know alkyl substituent because of that rearrangement because of that hydride shift. Uh, so watch out for that. Okay, so the other thing to watch out for Friel Crafts uh, alkylation, of course, uh, is that your Lewis acid complex, your alkyl halide and Lewis acid complex, uh, can be attacked directly from the ring. You don't actually have to break off your carbocation first. Uh, we kind of saw this uh, in our previous examples with, um, you know, with the halogenation. I I think when I first introduced uh, the idea of uh, you know, using iron bromide, iron three bromide, and bromine to put a bromine uh, to substitute a bromine on your benzene. Um, I initially said that we could use, you know, we make a bromonium ion, but the subsequent mechanisms showed that it was actually the, um, you know, your benzene actually attacked the bromine while it was still attached to your. Um, to your iron complex, right? So in the same way here, our benzene can directly attack our Lewis acid complex. Okay, so something to watch out for there. Okay, so here's what that mechanism looks like uh, when you have it directly attacking that um, the, the uh, site where that chlorine is attached. Okay, uh, of course you can see here that when that happens, uh, of course, there we get that primary product. Though keep in mind that this is the minor product uh, that we make. Okay, this is um, you know it's uh, more likely to have that uh, you know that secondary product is going through a lower energy transition state. So that's definitely going to be the major product. Okay, all right. So yeah, so basically. Uh, the other reason, uh, you know, from a sort of um, collision theory standpoint, if you're trying to understand why is that secondary product the uh, the major product, uh, keep in mind that uh, you do need a collision between your uh, benzene ring and your complex to have, you know, that primary product uh, form. So. In the meantime, though, that hydride shift is intramolecular, right? It's happening, you know, the pieces are right there, all in that complex. Uh, so it more readily forms that secondary intermediate. Okay, and so that's probably going to form before a benzene ring collides with that complex to make the primary product. Okay, so that's that's a major uh, limitation to Friel Crafts, and it's uh, definitely not the only one. So let's look at Friel Crafts alkylation and take into account what are the things we need to consider when we are uh, relying on a Friel Crafts alkylation.
okay? Uh, first of all, you need your leaving group, your, hi uh, your halogen has to be attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon, okay? We, we saw this back actually in, um, you know, uh, back in the chapter on substitution reactions uh, way back in, um, you know, in, in the first semester, uh, your leaving group is going to have trouble leaving an sp2 or sp3 hybridized carbon because that's just not very uh, stable, uh, not very good at stabilizing that, that cation as a result, okay? Um, definitely not at, uh, you know, that... Um, directly on that sp2 carbon, right? If, if you had the chlorine over here uh, and you had an allelic carbocation, that'd be fine. In fact, that'd probably be, that would be great. Uh, but here, your chlorine is attached directly to that sp2 carbon. That's not going to leave very easily. Uh, same thing over here. Here we have a chlorine directly attached to our benzene. Again, that's our sp2 carbon. This is not good. You're not going to break that bond and leave behind. Uh, a carbocation here, right? This would lose aromaticity. It would be very difficult to do that. So in both these cases, we do not see a reaction. So your alkyl halide has to have the chlorine on an sp3 hybridized carbon. The other thing to watch out for, uh, it's often difficult to stop this at uh, you know, just one substitution, all right? We're going to see uh, later on that alkyl groups are activating groups. Uh, so um, as such, they, they kind of activate that benzene, they push electron density into that benzene ring, making it more nucleophilic, and therefore polyalkylation oftentimes can occur. And so this is something, again, you have to consider when designing a synthesis with Friel-Crafts alkylation. And, and we'll look at at this later on in this chapter, we'll we'll see ways we can kind of control this. And then finally, the the other thing to look at is uh, actually the opposite. Uh, if you have a deactivating group on your benzene ring, um, you know basically it might not be reactive enough to occur. Even with your Lewis acid catalyst, uh, you still need an electron-rich ring to act as your nucleophile in this situation. All right, so if you have a deactivating group that sort of sucks electron density away from that ring, uh, you're not going to have a Friedel-Crafts alkylation occur. Okay, uh, and again, we'll talk more about activating and deactivating groups later on in this chapter. Now, in addition to Friedel-Crafts uh, alkylation, we can also do what's called a Friedel-Crafts acylation. So uh, essentially, we have uh, an acyl group is basically a ketone or a carbonyl. Uh, with a, you know, basically it's attached to our benzene ring from that carbonyl, okay? So, uh, again, very similar to, to a ketone in that you have these two uh, carbons attached to your carbonyl carbon, uh, but again, specifically when we, when we have a carbonyl with an R group attached to it, we refer to that as an acyl group. Okay, uh, the difference here, of course, we're still using a Lewis acid, but instead of an alkyl halide, we're going to use uh, an acyl halide uh, or an acid chloride as it's also known okay so so instead of our uh, you know our alkyl group attached to our chlorine leaving group we have our acyl group here okay so instead of going through a carbocation we use what's called an acylium uh, ion so it's essentially your acyl group converted into a cation. So uh, much in the same way your uh, Lewis acid, your aluminum center in your Lewis acid picks up your chlorine uh, and forms this complex here. Uh, if you cleave that uh, carbon-chlorine bond, of course, there's your acylium ion. And once again, you have that uh, formal positive charge, which makes this a, a pretty good electrophile. All right, uh, something to keep in mind here, the uh, acylibine is resonance stabilized. Again, that kind of helps uh, with the stability um, of that intermediate, right? And it helps that, um, you know, makes it uh, stay, uh, you know, helps it uh, last long enough to react with your benzene, basically. So as before, we have a very similar mechanism. Again, you have your, uh, your electrophile here, your acylium ion as your electrophile. Uh, you know, so your your benzene ring attacks that, uh, forms that sigma complex, which you know as always is resin stabilized and therefore much more stable. Uh, your aluminum complex acts as a base here, plucks off that proton, restores aromaticity, and there's your product.
Okay, and of course, uh, your aluminum chloride is regenerated, as, and so therefore it's behaving catalytically. All right, so coming back to that earlier problem that we ran into with Friedelcraft's alkylation, uh, remember we can't use a primary alkyl halide because it's going to rearrange. We're going to get the secondary or tertiary rearrangement due to a hydride shift that occurs. Um, so how do we get primary alkyl groups on a benzene ring? And the answer is actually to go through a uh, acyl uh, intermediate, right? So um, we saw that that acylamine doesn't rearrange, which is great. Um, you know, so we can do the, our Friedelcraft's acylation and then reduce that resulting acyl group, the, the carbonyl in our acyl group, uh, back down to an alkyl group. So we do this through what's called a Clemenson reduction. Uh, essentially, we use amalgamated zinc, so zinc that's kind of dissolved in mercury and uh, reacted with hydrochloric acid and heated up. Uh, and that gets rid of the carbonyl. It reduces it down to just a regular sp3 hybridized carbon uh, to your regular methylene carbon. And, um, and you've got your alkyl halide. And notice that your alkyl group here is a primary alkyl group. Okay, uh, another thing to, to realize with, um, with the Friedelcraft's acylation versus the alkylation is that acylation uh, does not involve polysubstitution. Uh, we'll see later on that uh, acyl groups are deactivating, unlike alkyl groups which are activating, uh, and therefore uh, the uh, acyl group kind of makes that benzene ring a little bit uh, less electron rich and therefore it's not going to want to keep on undergoing Friedel-Crafts reactions. Okay, so we've talked a bit about activating and deactivating groups. Uh, let's uh, go and examine that in more detail. Okay, what does it mean for a group to be activating versus deactivating? Um, as the name implies, an activating group makes our benzene more active and more reactive. It, uh, for example, if we look at toluene, which is just methyl benzene, uh, we'll notice that it undergoes nitration much, much faster than plain old benzene. All right, so why is that? Well, the methyl group on our toluene activates our benzene ring. Uh, we've seen before that, that alkyl groups kind of push electron density uh, away towards whatever they're bonded to, right? We saw this way back uh, when we looked at carbocations back in substitution reactions, right? Um, if you have more alkyl groups attached to your carbocation carbon, um, you know, so if you have a tertiary carbocation, for example, it's much, much more stable than a primary one because those alkyl groups are pushing electron density and sort of uh, stabilizing that carbocation. They're kind of like counteracting it a little bit, right? They're balancing it in a way. Okay, we, we call that hyperconjugation. It's the uh, carbon hydrogen bonds in your alkyl group that overlap with that MTP orbital on your carbocation, right? Uh, so in much a similar way, we still have a hyperconjugation here where those carbon hydrogen bonds kind of overlap with the p orbitals on our uh, in our conjugated pi system of our benzene ring. Okay, and so as a result, are able to kind of push electron density towards that benzene ring. In addition to making our reactions happen faster, uh, these groups, these activating groups, also control the regiochemistry, the regioselectivity of where uh, other substituents, uh, you know, the, the incoming substituents go. All right, so for example, uh, I pointed out that, you know, in toluene, that methyl group uh, is an activating group, right? It's, it's an, like all alkyl groups, it's activating. Now, if we do a nitration reaction, where is that nitro group going to show up on our benzene ring? Is it going to be at the ortho position, the meta position, or the para position? Well, it turns out that it selectively prefers the ortho and para positions, but not the meta position, right? Uh, and why is that? Okay. Well, to understand this, we've got to look back at that sigma complex and also look at the resonance structures associated with it. All right, so if we look at our 
uh, you know, if we have our nitro group attacking at the ortho position, for example, notice that the sigma complex involves a positive formal charge on that carbon that the methyl group is attached to, right? And as I pointed out earlier, uh, alkyl groups stabilize carbocations. They push electron density uh, towards that, that MTP orbital through hyperconjugation and make that a more stable complex. Okay, so it makes sense that the activation energy for this uh, for this sigma complex is going to be lower in energy and therefore much more favorable. What about for meta and para positions? So if we have the um, the uh, our nitronium ion add on at the para position, notice that we also wind up with a an intermediate. Uh, one of our uh, resin structures where that positive formal charge is on the carbon that our alkyl group is attached to. And again, we have that stabilization from the uh, that hyperconjugation off that alkyl group. It's going to push electron density towards that carbocation and therefore lower the potential energy of this sigma complex. And therefore, you know, you're, you're going to need less activation energy to get this reaction going towards that product. What about the meta one, though? If you notice, if we look at the resin structures for the um, nitronium ion adding at the meta position, notice that the positive charge on our sigma complex skips over that carbon with the alkyl group attached to it. As a result, this is not going to be lower in energy. It's going to be at the same energy as you'd expect Okay, uh, for like any sigma complex. So, you know, what this means though, of course, then, is that since the activation energy is lower for those other two sigma complexes, we're, you know, that's basically giving it a kinetic pathway. We're gonna make that uh, kinetic product uh, by going through that lower activation energy. We're gonna make more of that product faster. In addition to alkyl groups, which uh, are activating through hyperconjugation, Alkoxy groups are also uh, activating groups, and they activate the benzene ring through induction. All right, so basically, the lone pair on your oxygen uh, pushes electron density into your ring through resonance structures. Um, uh, as you can see here, uh, basically, these electrons can't swing towards the alkyl part of the alkoxy group because you know that would involve a Texas carbon. You'd have five bonds to your carbon, so obviously they can't go that way. Uh, but we can have them swing down this way and get involved in multiple resonance structures, as you can see here. And you can see that that resulting uh, Zwitter ion, or the negative charge of the Zwitter ion, is pushed around your benzene ring, uh, and therefore is resonance stabilized. Okay, so um, so your methoxy group in this example is, is the is even more activating than uh, your typical alkyl group. So uh, as a result, uh, you know you can activate the groups. You know sometimes that can be a bad thing synthetically in that you uh, encourage poly substitution. Right, your your ring is so active that it undergoes. Uh, your reaction even more than you might want. So, so you can see here that uh, we have a poly substitution where we don't just add one bromine, but we actually add it at both ortho positions and the para position. Okay. Um, notice again that just like our methyl group earlier, like alkyl groups, the um, methoxy group is still an ortho para director. Okay. So our new substituent comes in selectively at those ortho and para positions, but not the meta position. And and you can kind of, if I go back a slide, you can kind of see uh, also like how that um, that negative charge uh, on your carbocation is kind of pushed around selectively to those ortho and para positions, but not the meta position. They kind of skip over the meta positions, and that's why uh, those uh, sigma complexes are not favored, they're not uh, stabilized. So here are those resonance structures uh, for the different uh, sigma complexes we can form by um, having our new substituent at various positions. And again, notice with those ortho and para um, 
substituents that the we have an extra resin structure due to the involvement of those lone pairs on that oxygen um, and so we have more resin stabilization and we don't have that um, available in you know with our new group at the meta position notice again that the uh, sigma complex kind of skips over uh, the carbon with our um, you know, where our methoxy group is attached to our benzene ring and therefore those, um, those lone pairs in that auction can't get involved. Okay, so just like before with our methyl group, again, notice how much, uh, you know, the difference in activation energy. Uh, it's, you know, it's not that like the, um, the complex with the meta-positioned group is uh, raised in activation energy, but it's more that the activation energy of the ortho and para ones are lowered, and that's what drives the reaction towards those products. Okay. Oh, a uh, quick point here uh, about the uh, para uh, product. Notice that again, the activation energy is even lower for that para uh, product as opposed to the ortho one, uh, due to steric hindrance from this uh, alkoxy group. Yeah, you, know, you still have this this alkyl group that's, uh, you know, sticking out here, uh, it is better to have the um, your uh, incoming substituent at the para position because there's less steric hindrance there. Okay, so in general, as I pointed out, uh, all activating groups are ortho para directos, all right? So, so that's something to keep in mind when you're, one, when you're designing syntheses or when you're just, like, you know, trying to uh, figure out how you get from you know reactant A to product B. So with that in mind, let's let's practice this. So here we're starting off with a benzene ring, and we want to wind up with this dye substituted product. Okay, so notice that we have a nitro group here, we have an alkyl group here. Um, and I'll point out it's a primary alkyl group. Uh, that might be a hint as to what's going on here. Uh, so ask yourself what uh, you know what order. Uh, you know, what reagents to use and what order do you use them in, okay? Because you'll find that uh, the order in which you put in your uh, your substituents might be important here because of those directing effects, okay? And we'll practice that some more, but pause the video here and go ahead and see if you can figure out uh, this one before I show you the answer slide. Okay, so if you're back after having paused this video and taken a crack at this problem, let's look at the answer. Okay, so, so I went out of my way to point out that this was a al uh, primary alkyl group. And so that should have, re uh, should have uh, hopefully raised a red flag in your head that you can just do a simple, uh, you know, alkyl, uh, Friedel uh, Crafts alkylation because, of course, you, you know, can't add a primary substituent that way, right? It's, uh, you know, it would rearrange, especially, you know, given... Uh, this kind of alkyl group and the fact that we've got a tertiary site right here, it would rearrange to, to give you uh, the tert butyl group on here instead. Um, so you actually have to do an acylation and then reduce it accordingly, okay, to get that alkyl group. Now, notice that we're also adding on a nitro group, okay? Now, the order in which we do this is very important because we want the nitro group and the alkyl group to be para to each other. Well, we know that this alkyl group is ortho para directing. All right, so it's very important that we have that alkyl group in place uh, before we try to add on the nitro group. Now, the other thing to consider is, does it matter whether we do our nitration before or after converting our acyl group into the alkyl group? And the answer is yes, right? Our acyl group, I think I may have pointed out earlier, is also a deactivating group, just like the nitro group. Um, so neither the acyl group nor a nitro group would be useful for getting our two substituents here to wind up being paired to each other. So it's very important that we first do our acylation and then reduce it, do our Clemenson reduction to an alkyl group, and only then proceed to adding on our nitro group. All right, so that's a nice segue into our deactivating groups, right? We, I just mentioned that our acyl groups and our nitro groups are deactivating. What ramifications do deactivating groups have on, uh, on our benzene ring and our synthetic methods? 
Okay, well, again, as just as activating groups push electron density into your benzene ring, deactivating groups suck it away. They pull electron density away from your benzene ring and therefore make that ring less electron rich, all right? And hence the name deactivating. So the way this influences our transition states is kind of a little bit backwards from activating groups. Instead of making certain transition states more stable and therefore lower the potential energy, uh, instead what's going to happen here is that our transition states are actually going to increase in energy. All right, so, so later on when we start looking at the selectivity of a lot of these deactivating groups, uh, it's due to this opposite effect. It's because the products that don't form are made less stable, or their transition states are made less stable, rather than the products that are formed uh, you know, through more stable transition states, like, the, like with the activating groups that we just saw. All right, so let's see an example here. So if we have a nitro group in place, and we look at another uh, substituent adding on, uh, again, if we look at the, um, you know, at our, um, at our sigma complexes, notice that with an ortho group, or you know, with a substituent coming in that ortho position, we have a positive formal charge on that carbon that our nitro group is attached to, and with a para position one, we again wind up with that positive charge on that carbon that the nitro group's attached to. In both those cases, remember, our nitro group's gonna be sucking away electron density. That's gonna destabilize that carbocation, right? It's already positive. You're pulling electron density away from something that's already positive, right? That's gonna increase that potential energy, right? It's gonna increase the activation energy for that transition, uh, for that transition state, okay? Uh, the meta, uh, you know, with the meta position, um, you know, that sigma complex skips over that issue, right? You still have a, uh, you know, it's still got a relatively high activation energy, but it's not, you know, as high as these sigma complexes if you have the substituent coming on at the ortho or para position. Okay, and so, so essentially the, the meta attack here is just, not as bad as the other ones, okay? And that's why uh, deactivating groups tend to favor meta um, attack, okay? And you can see here, uh, you know, in contrast this with the activating groups, it's not so much that the ortho, uh, that the meta position is lowered in activation energy, it's just more that the ortho and para ones are raised in activation energy and made less favorable. All right, so, We've seen so far that if you have an activating group, it tends to be ortho and para directing. The new substituent coming in uh, comes in either at the ortho position or the para position, sometimes more selectively for the para position, depending on how bulky that activating group is. Okay, with the deactivating group, uh, we see that uh, generally it's gonna go to the meta position, right? And probably with a lower uh, reaction rate and lower yield than we would see with activating groups due to the you know, loss of, um, you know, that, that benzene ring becoming less electron rich. Halogens are the exception to this. Um, they're pretty electronegative, uh, and so therefore withdraw electrons through induction. So they're still like sucking away electron density from your benzene ring and deactivating that ring. However, they have lone pairs on them that don't really have anywhere else to go. And so therefore through resonance can be used to stabilize a transition state. Uh, and therefore, as we've seen with, with ortho and para groups, uh, there's a transition state where, um, you know, that uh, gets added when we have these inductive effects, when those lone pairs on that group, on that atom next to the ring gets involved. So we saw that earlier with our methoxy group. It's gonna be similar resonance structures here with a halogen. Okay, so here, again, notice that in the case of an our ortho and para positioned groups, uh, substituents coming in, notice that we have an extra uh, resonance structure in our sigma complex, and therefore it's more resonance stabilized. With the meta position, we do not have that extra resonance structure. It kind of skips over that position. The lone pairs on that chlorine can get involved, and therefore this does not have that extra resonance stabilization. So to kind of put this into perspective, I guess to try and compare the scope of this, let's compare four reactions. Let's say 
uh, we look at the nitration of benzene versus uh, the positional nitration of uh, chlorobenzene, right? So what happens when we try to get the, uh, the incoming nitro group at either the ortho, meta, or para positions of our chlorobenzene? Well, okay, so nitro, nitration of benzene, we'd have like just, you know, a standard set energy for that, right? Now, the uh, generally speaking, the nitration of chlorobenzene, okay, regardless of whether it's ortho, meta, or para, it's typically going to be at a higher energy than that for the nitration of benzene. Uh, chlorine is a halogen. It's still electronegative. It withdraws electron density through induction. And therefore, we're going to notice, you know, what we notice for deactivating groups. We're going to have slower reactions. We're going to have lower yields. Uh, and that's because the activation energy for uh, each of the nitrations of chlorobenzene being higher than that of the nitration of benzene. So I'm not actually going to draw it here, but but basically, you know, whatever you've got as the activation energy for the nitration of benzene, the next three reactions are all going to have a higher activation energy. However, if we are comparing the ortho nitration of chlorobenzene versus the meta nitration versus the para nitration, you'll notice that the uh, the para and ortho nitrations will have a slightly lower activation energy compared to the meta nitration. They'd still be higher than the nitration of plain old benzene, uh, but they'd be lower than that of meta, uh, the uh, nitration coming in at the meta position. Okay, and again, it's due to that extra resonance structure and that stabilization that arises from that. Okay, so let's summarize this. All right, let's look at different substituents on our benzene and ask ourselves, what category category can we put this in? And what do all the different examples in these categories have in common, right? How can we look at a substituent benzene and immediately know what type of group is this? Is it an activating group or a deactivating group? And you know, how is it activating or deactivating? Is it strongly deactivating? Is it moderately activating? You know, is it weakly activating? Let's let's go break this down to different categories. All right, so here we have strong activators. Now, notice what all of these have in common. We have an oxygen or nitrogen attached to that benzene ring, uh, but notice that these oxygen and nitrogens have groups attached to them that don't really have anywhere else for those electrons to go, right? These, these electrons are not going uh, you know, can't go or it's towards this hydrogen or to these, uh, you know, or to this R group. And so they have to get pushed towards the, um, towards the ring. Okay. Um, and so basically those lone pairs can be used in an inductive effect and uh, therefore can, you know, push that electron density into the ring. Next up, we have moderate activators. Now, just like with strong activators, we have oxygens and nitrogens here with their lone pairs attached to our ring. Uh, but unlike the uh, strong activators, we have a carbonyl next to those oxygens. Now, what this does is it does, you know, involve a little bit of sucking away of electron density, right? This this carbonyl can be uh, you know, can have its uh, these pi electrons pushed onto the oxygen, giving it a negative formal charge, and that would cause these electrons to not only go towards the ring, but they could also be pulled away from the ring in this way. Uh, and so, due to that, this is a you know not as strong an activator as here, where those electrons have to only go towards the ring. Here, they can also go towards that carbonyl. Uh, however, the um, you know, basically, we also have resonance structures where these electrons uh, can kind of be involved in pushing that electron density, um, you know, around. We basically have an extra resonance structure, and therefore we can stabilize that sigma complex a little bit more. Okay. Uh, notice that we have our alkoxy group here. Uh, normally, you'd think, okay, an alkoxy group would be uh, up here, but I, I guess with the, um, in terms of the actual. Uh, you know, results we see in practice, it looks like it's more moderate than strong activator. So uh, something to keep in mind there. Uh, finally, we have weak activating groups. With weak activators, um, they don't work through induction at all. We have alkyl groups, and they only work through hyperconjugation. So pretty straightforward there. 
Uh, next, we have weak deactivators. Uh, so with our weak deactivators, we have our halogens. Uh, as we pointed out, they are deactivating because uh, through inductive effects, they suck electron density towards them. Uh, but remember, those lone pairs are involved in resonance structures that you know involve pushing those electrons towards the ring, even though a, you know, from an electronegativity standpoint, it kind of works against it. Um, you know, so that's why we have that kind of sort of juxtaposition there, I guess. You have an ortho para director like all the other activating groups, but it's deactivating. And, uh, you know, due to that electronegativity uh, and that inductive effect, but again, that's what makes it a weak deactivator, okay? Because you have that countering effect from those lone pairs getting involved in the resonance structures. Then we've got moderate deactivators. Now, what do all of these have in common? All of them involve something, you know, essentially you have uh, some sort of carbonyl or carbonyl equivalent uh, where that uh, non-oxygen atom, so in most cases a carbon or in this case a sulfur, are attached to the ring directly. Um, so you don't have a lone pair on these atoms. That's the key thing. Unlike the moderate activating groups where at least the, you had an oxygen or nitrogen that had a lone pair on it that could be pushed towards the ring, here there's nothing that pushes electron density towards the ring. Instead, uh, that carbonyl, like with a moderate activator, sucks electron density away, but it only sucks electron density away. Okay, so through an inductive effect, those electrons get pulled towards the oxygens here, or in this case, the nitrogen, if in the case of this uh, nitrile group, um, and that pulls electron density away from the ring through resonance, okay? And then finally, we have strong deactivators. Um, again, we just have multiple electronegative uh, elements, like so we have, either have multiple oxygens of this nitrogen, which put a formal positive charge in that nitrogen, uh, or we have multiple halogens here, again, very electronegative, um, really putting a positive, uh, you know, a partial positive charge on that carbon. Or in this case here with a, uh, you know, with an ammonium ion, we have a formal positive charge on that nitrogen. Again, the, having that positive charge on that ring is definitely going to suck electron density away from the ring. Uh, you know, trying to sort of uh, counteract that positive charge. Okay, and that's what makes these groups uh, strong deactivators. So again, uh, noticing these patterns in these different groups will help you on a quiz or exam. In general, if you're looking at a molecule, ask yourself which category does this molecule, does this substituent fit into? And so therefore, is, you know, do I have uh, when you're trying to think, first of all, is this an activating or deactivating group? Uh, is this going to be ortho pa para directing or is it going to be meta directing? You know, and of course, remember halogens are the exception there. And then, of course, look at the scope of that or the strength of that activating or deactivating group. Okay, because that will affect things like reaction rate and yield. Okay, so if you have a strong activating group, not only is it going to be ortho para directing, but it'll also have a uh, you know a high yield. It might be a very uh, you know uh, reaction with a very fast rate, and therefore it might be hard to control poly substitution. You know, those are things to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, yeah, like I said, basically look at your group, look if it's. Uh, Determine if it's activating or deactivating. Um, you know, is your group electron withdrawing, electron donating? Uh, and then accordingly, if it's electron donating, it's probably an activating group. If it's withdrawing, it's deactivating. And of course, like I said, look at the strength of it. Okay? And then uh, use that to determine whether it's going to be ortho, meta, or para directing. All right, so let's practice that. Have a look at this molecule here and ask yourself, uh, what type of group is this? Is it a, you know, is it an activating or deactivating group? Is it, uh, you know, ortho, meta, para directing, uh, you know, ortho, para, or meta directing rather? And is it going to be strongly activating or strongly deactivating? Okay, so if you've taken a second to think about this, you probably realize, uh, hopefully, that this nitrogen has lone pairs on it, okay? So we know that those lone pairs are going to get involved in being pushed towards that ring. So this is probably going to be an activating group. However, notice that carbonyl right next to it. Okay, so it's not going to be a strongly activating group, but it's probably going to be a moderate activator. 
Okay, but as an activating group, it's going to be ortho para directing. Now, notice that this group is relatively bulky, so there's probably going to be a preference for that para uh, direction rather than the ortho direction. But there's going to be some steric hindrance here. Okay, so uh, here and of course this you can rotate around this carbon nitrogen bond. Uh, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a barrier to rotation due to like you know, one of the resonance structures having some double bond character here. But but my point here is that this uh, this carbon over here, or this hydrogen as well, is going to be sterically hindered when this group swings around over here. So both these ortho positions, uh, while uh, electronically are favorable, might be sterically a little bit less favorable. All right, so now we've seen how one substituent directs a second substituent coming in. What do you do if you have two substituents on your benzene ring, right? How, um, you know, how do you determine uh, which one takes priority in determining the uh, addition of the incoming third substituent? So look at this example here. We have a methyl group over here on top, okay, that's an alkyl group, and we have a nitro group here on the bottom, okay. Now. Uh, quickly looking at these types of groups. We know alkyl groups are activating, we know nitro groups are deactivating, right? And so the, the uh, methyl group is going to be ortho paradirecting and the nitro group is going to be meta directing. So the question is, uh, where does the incoming bromine go? Now, first of all, it, these two groups need not necessarily uh, work against each other. So uh, what is ortho to your methyl group is actually meta from the nitro group's perspective, right? So, so your bromine is actually going to show up uh, basically at this position over here or here, uh, which is ortho to your uh, methyl group. But uh, notice that uh, from the nitro group's perspective, this is the ortho position, and that's actually the meta position, uh, which remember your nitro group's meta directing, so uh, that actually works out pretty well. Okay, so that's where that bromine shows up. It shows up at that position that's ortho to that methyl group or meta to that nitro group. Okay, now have a look at this one. This one's a little bit tougher. Here we have an alcohol group. All right, so again, think about the lone pairs on that hydrogen and uh, you know if you recall this is going to be a um, an activating group right those those lone pairs can be uh, pushed towards that ring and you know you have an inductive effect and of course as we established already that alkyl group that methyl group is going to be um, you know an activating group as well now here we have a conflict right because uh, that alcohol group will want your incoming nitro group to show up at that ortho position, right? Um, for the alkyl group, which is also activating, that nitro group would want to show up at that, uh, you know, the ortho position to that, but that position is meta to the alcohol group. Likewise, the uh, ortho position to the alcohol group is meta from the um, alkyl group's perspective, right? So, which one takes priority? Well, this is why we wanted to categorize our groups into strong activators, or strong deactivators, or moderate, or weak, um, because that is kind of what we use as our tiebreaker there. So these are both activating groups, um, but you have to remember that an alkyl group is only weakly activating, uh, where uh, whereas an alcohol group uh, is a stronger activator, right? So um, as a result, this alcohol group is going to take priority. The nitro group is going to show up at the position that's ortho to that. Okay, and that is what we observe. Okay, um, another consideration to take into account is sterics. Uh, here we have two alkyl groups, so they're both weak activators, which one takes priority? Well, um, while both groups want to get the nitro group ortho to it, uh, it makes more sense to have it ortho to the smaller uh, methyl group. Okay, there's less steric hindrance there. Okay, uh, so it makes sense that this product over here on the left is the major product, this product over here is the minor product. Okay, um, likewise here, um, with this one, we've got a, uh, you know, we have 
two groups, um, but they're no longer parallel to each other. Uh, so what's ortho to both of them? Well, we have an ortho position here, we have an ortho position here, and technically there's a, another ortho position between the two of them. Well, that one's flat out, right? There you've got steric hindrance with both groups. Um, here you have steric hindrance with this bulkier group. Uh, so it makes sense that having the nitro group over here at this position that's uh, ortho to this uh, methyl group and para to the larger bulkier group is your major product. Okay, Whereas over here on the other side is the minor product. Okay, so with that in mind, you want to consider how can we force groups to go where we want them to, right? So sometimes we want a an incoming substituent to show up in a position that might not be immediately obvious or might not be, uh, you know, immediately uh, feasible, right? So if we look at uh, this bulky terpetal group here, uh, we know that that's going to be ortho para directing, but it's going to prefer to have a group be para, right? Because we've got this bulky group, uh, that para position is going to be much more favorable than those ortho positions. However, we can see here that we're trying to put this bromine at the ortho position. So the question is, how do we do that, right? How do we force that bromine to go to that ortho position instead of the more favorable para position? Okay, and the answer is blocking groups. We want to block off that para position so that the bromine has no choice but to go to the ortho position. Once the bromine's been added, we remove our blocking group and we now have the product we want. All right, so you remember earlier, it, you know, when we were looking at the different types of reactions, and I pointed out that when we sulfonate a, a benzene, right, we add on that sulfonic acid group, uh, we do that by, you know, using uh, concentrated uh, sulfuric acid with sulfur trioxide, also known as fuming sulfuric acid. I pointed out back then that it's possible to reverse this reaction using dilute sulfuric acid. Uh, so we have a lot of water present. We can actually uh, do the reverse reaction and remove uh, that uh, sulfonic acid group. Well, here's where that is really useful because that is a great example of a blocking group. We can use that uh, sulfonic acid to block off a site, and then once we have um, you know, added on the substituents we want, we can remove that sulfonic acid group and we have the product we want. So that's actually what happens here. So we use fuming sulfuric acid to block off that para position with a sulfonic acid group. We then do our bromination, so we uh, you know, use bromine and our iron 3 bromide, and of course that puts the bromine over at the um, at that ortho position uh, because there is no para position for it to take up. It has to go to that ortho, ortho position. And then once we've done that, we use dilute sulfuric acid to get rid of that, um, of our sulfonic acid group. Okay, so to summarize all of the reactions we've looked at, okay, so this is probably a great slide to, to reference when you're uh, you know, studying the different reactions in this chapter. Um, basically, starting off at a benzene, we can do our EAS reactions. We can swap out a hydrogen for a particular functional group. Uh, you know, if we want a halogen like a bromine, we can use bromine and iron 3 bromide or aluminium bromide. Um, and if we, can, if we want chlorine, we can do the same thing using aluminium chloride. Uh, we want to do uh, add a nitro group here. We can use nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Um, for a sulfonic acid group, use fuming sulfuric acid. Uh, then we have the friel crafts reactions, right? So if we have a, um, you know, a Lewis acid like aluminum chloride, we can then use an alkyl halide or an acid chloride, also known as an acyl chloride, uh, to add an alkyl or acyl group respectively. Okay. Now, with that in mind, of course, there are further steps. Remember, if we want an amine, we can take a nitro group and reduce it by using iron or zinc and HCl. Um, if we have an acyl group and we want to have the corresponding primary alkyl halide, uh, a primary alkyl substituent, we can do a Clemenson reaction uh, reduction using amalgamate, amalgamated zinc, uh, hydrochloric acid, and heat it up together. 
Okay, so again, please note that this is the only way to to get a primary, uh, you know, alkyl group, uh, other than of course a methyl group. Um, you know, because you can't do this directly from a Friedel Crafts uh, alkylation. And then, of course, if you think back to the last chapter, uh, once you have an alkyl group in place, uh, that benzylic carbon is pretty reactive. And of course, we can do, uh, you know, radical reactions at that, st uh, you know, at that location. All right, we can use bromine or NBS to to brominate that location. Um, or we can use an oxidizing agent like potassium permanganate or uh, sodium dichromate to convert that into a carboxylic acid. Okay, so with that in mind, you have to think about uh, not only the functional groups you want, but also their directing effects. Okay, uh, and as I pointed out earlier in this chapter, um, order of operations here is kind of important because of those directing effects, uh, and also considering like you know whether you have an activating or deactivating group. Okay, so let's let's uh, look at three nitro bromo benzene. So uh, that tells us that the bromine is in the number one position, and the nitro group is going to be. Uh, meta to that. Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, we have another example here of three chloroaniline. Okay, so that means we have an amino group at the number one position, and we have a chlorine number three position. Okay, so uh, both of these steps might not be very straightforward. Okay, uh, you know, in the case of a uh, bromine and the nitro group which one do we add on first? You might be tempted to say we add on the bromine first uh, because it's listed as being at the number one position in the way the name's written out. Uh, but remember, bromine as a halogen is orthopara directing. I've just established that nitro group is meta to that bromine. So it doesn't make sense to have the bromine on first. However, nitro groups, of course, are meta-directing. So uh, this tells us we should add, we should do our nitration first, to add on our nitro group, and then uh, do our halogenation. Okay. Um, this one is going to be interesting because uh, you, if you have your uh, amino group on first, again, that is also uh, ortho-para-directing, right? Uh, and we want this chlorine at the meta position. Okay, so you've got to think back to how your amine is added on. Remember, it's not added on directly, right? You've got to first uh, make a nitro group, put on a nitro group, and then you reduce that into an amine. And that is the trick to doing this one. Um, remember, your nitro group is, is meta directing. So what you actually do is you first put on your nitro group, then you add your chlorine at the meta position, and then you reduce that uh, that nitro group into an amine, okay, and turn it into an amylin. Okay, so to summarize uh, those directing effects, uh, we've got this slide here. So again, this might be another useful one to have on hand. Uh, I mean, you can you can derive all this stuff uh, just by knowing all the other. Um, you know, the uh, other reactions and their directing effects. But uh, this is kind of a little like, you know, sort of study guide, I guess, in a way, a little shortcut sheet to thinking about how do I want to get, uh, you know, how do I switch up uh, the directing effects of something? Okay, so uh, again, notice that here we have a nitro group that has are, um, you know, that's a meta director, but if we reduce that to an amine, now we have an ortho para director. Uh, here we have an alkyl group, which is an orthopara director. Um, of course, if we oxidize that into a carboxylic acid, uh, which is a deactivating group, now we have a meta director. Okay, um, and, and of course, uh, you know, if we have an acyl group, we can reduce that doing a Clemenson reduction to an alkyl group. Again, that changes from being a meta director to an orthopara director. And finally, uh, remember if uh, if we have uh, a lot of halogens on that um, on that benzylic position, now this is a very strong deactivator. So even though an alkyl group is an orthopara director, the uh, resulting halogenated alkyl group is a meta director. Okay, 
Now, that being said, uh, there are some uh, limitations you, could, you should consider when you're designing syntheses, okay? Uh, something to watch out for with a, with nitration. Uh, remember, you're using concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid. Those are very reactive reagents. Uh, and you want to consider that uh, if you have more sensitive uh, you know, substituents already on your uh, on your benzene ring, they might not stay that way. Uh, they might not stay those substituents uh, if you try to do a nitration. Okay, so in this case, for example, here, uh, you know, you have an amine, um, and if you do this under nitric and sulfuric acid conditions, nitric concentrated nitric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. Uh, you might uh, oxidize this amine, and it won't stay an amine. Okay, so you don't get this uh, nice, like, you know, para nitro complex or nitro product, sorry. All right, Friedel Crafts. Remember, one of the key requirements for Friedel Crafts reaction is that you need a, uh, you know, an activating group, and having a deactivating group uh, might prevent the reaction from happening. So, uh, in in this in both these examples here, we have uh, moderate to, to strong deactivating groups, and therefore, you know, we actually don't see a reaction occurring for this Friedel Crafts alkylation. Okay, so with that in mind, let's uh, try a practice problem here. So go ahead and see if you can uh, synthesize this uh, dibenzoic acid. Uh, notice that the benzoic acids are ortho to each other. Okay, so if you had paused this and tried this out, uh, you probably realize there are a few, uh, you know, a few uh, issues here. Uh, one, our carboxylic acids are meta directors, so it seems unlikely that we have uh, ortho para directors, uh, or that we'd have both these groups ortho to each other. Uh, secondly, the bulkiness of those carboxylic acids would, uh, you know, prevent you from having the group come in at. A, an ortho position, even if it were ortho pattern directing, right? Um, you know, it it makes sense that you'd first, uh, you know, add that second substituent to the para position as opposed to the ortho position. So, those are two considerations to keep in mind when you're doing this reaction. So, how do we get around that? Well, first of all, um, you don't want, you know, you don't want to add on your second group once you've already got a carboxylic acid. You need it to be something that's ortho para directing. Okay. Um, and so in this example though, it is uh, we're gonna, you know, start off with an alkyl group. So we do a Friedel-Crafts alkylation. All right. Uh, and so we you know we get a um, uh, we basically get a methyl group on here. It really doesn't matter which alkyl group we have. Uh, you could use any um, alkyl group here because uh, we're going to re react to that benzylic position regardless. Uh, the only caveat here is you have to have a proton on that um, uh, on that benzylic carbon. So you can't use a terpbutyl chloride, for example. Okay, so here we're using methyl chloride. It's probably the most efficient way to do it. Uh, any carbons beyond that is kind of, are kind of wasted. So we do that twice. We have two equivalents of it. So we're going to add two methyl groups onto this uh, to this benzene. All right, and then of course we can oxidize them to carboxylic acids using a strong oxidizing agent like potassium permanganate. Now, uh, one issue that this uh, synthesis that the this answer slide has addressed. Uh, is that we, you know, we have both of our alkyl groups ortho to each other. Um, we don't have another one here that's para. If if anything, I would have thought the uh, para product would be more uh, likely, right? Even though methyl groups are relatively tiny, it still makes sense that you would probably get, uh, you know, a substitution at that uh, at that para position. Okay, so. So something to consider then is that um, you know you may want to use a blocking group here, like sulfonic acid, to block off that um, uh, that uh, para position. Then add on your your second alkyl group at the ortho position, uh, and then you know and then remove that accordingly. All right, let's uh, try another one here. So this one's a little bit tougher. We've got three substituents, uh, and we you know. Uh, don't know 
Uh, we want to kind of work backwards here. That's probably the best way to kind of figure things out. Instead of starting from benzene and thinking like, okay, what order should I add these things in? Uh, it might be useful to think backwards and think, um, you know, which one did I add last? All right. Um, so, uh, by the way, just to you know, jog your memories, remember this is a retrosynthetic arrow. I think we, we first introduced this last semester, uh, but this means that you're working through uh, the synthesis backwards. Okay, so this arrow, instead of saying like, oh, this is your reactant and this is your product, what this is implying is that this is the product, it came from what reactant. Okay, so you're going backwards a step. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, what is the last group attached here? So a big hint here would be the uh, how activating, or rather how deactivating, our groups are. Now, all three of our groups are deactivating groups, actually. Uh, you know, you have your bromine, which is a weak deactivator. Uh, you have your acyl group over here on the right, which is a moderate deactivator. Uh, but most importantly, we have our nitro group here, which is a strong deactivator. Uh, so that actually would probably be the last group attached, because remember, uh, you know, here we've got an acyl group, which we add on through Friedel-Crafts acylation. Um, and in order for that to occur, you need an electron-rich ring. Uh, it's kind of difficult to do that with a nitro group on there. Okay, so that's probably the last thing we add on. All right, so so this is probably what uh, we uh, you know we we've got uh, right there. Okay, it it makes sense that we don't have the nitro group on here and try to add one of the other groups later because uh, that nitro group would interfere with that. Right, it's too deactivating. Okay, now let's keep working backwards. What can, you know, out of these two groups, which one must have been added on, uh, you know, in the previous step? Well, here you might want to consider the directing effects to each other, right? We have uh, bromine, which even though it's deactivating, is orthoparadirecting, right? And here we have an acyl group, which is metadirecting. Okay, now notice that these groups are paired to each other, so that should tell you then that uh, the bromine couldn't have been added last because if it were added last, uh, it would have been in the meta position. So it must be that acyl group that was added in the previous step. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean the bromine was added last. I mean like you know, in the you know if we added a retrosynthetic arrow over here, um, you know we don't uh, you know we should have bromine on the reactant that this product comes from. Okay, so so I guess I kind of. Uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, show that here. So if we if we go from if we were to write out all our first steps forwards, you know, from bro from benzene onwards, our first step would be to add that bromine. Okay, so we do that through our regular brom bromination. So you use bromine and you know aluminium bromide or iron three bromide. Then we add on our acyl group. So we have an acyl chloride here uh, with aluminium chloride. We do a Friedel-Crafts uh, acylation. Okay, and there we get that intermediate. And then we, in the last step, we add, uh, using concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid, we add our nitro group. And it's gonna show up here uh, at this position that is meta to our acyl group, which is where it wants to be, and ortho to our bromine, which is also, again, where it wants to be. So you can see how we're kind of forced uh, towards this route, right? We have to uh, basically, follow these steps. I know we, we have the reagents we need to put the substituents we want, but we have to go in this order in order to have the substituents show up where we want them. Um, you know, so that's the, one of the trickier things uh, with a lot of these EAS reactions. Not only do, do you have to consider the substituents, uh, the functional groups you're adding on, you also have to consider the directing effects off those functional groups. Okay, and that that affects what order you do your steps in. Okay, so we've talked a lot about EAS reactions in this chapter. Uh, however, there are two other uh, reactions that we want to look at. One of them is nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Um, the other is elimination addition reaction. So. Let's first look at nucleophilic aromatic substitution. In this reaction, we basically substitute out um, our 
one of our substituents, uh, notice that here we're using a nuclear file uh, to do this reaction. So uh, this is kind of weird, right? We have in all the other examples we've dealt with uh, electrophiles, things that had uh, either a formal or uh, really strongly partial positive charge. Here we have a hydroxide ion with a negative formal charge, uh, you know, and that's what the group that we're swapping in for. Okay, uh, so that's really interesting. You've got to you've got to think about the difference here. How can we do this reaction given what we've seen with with nucleophilic uh, or you know the uh, nucleophilicity of our benzene ring, the electron rich nature of that? Okay, so in order to do this, there are three uh, things you need to uh, you know basically to have a nucleophile work together with your nucleophilic benzene rather than uh, an electrophile as we've seen in EAS reactions. First, of course, you must make the ring electron poor. Okay, in order to, if you have a lot of electron density in that benzene, it's not prone for a, a nucleophile to attack it, right? So how do we do that? Well, we swap it out, or we substitute a uh, really deactivating, a very strong electron withdrawing group on the ring. I don't know if, uh, if I go back a slide, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed that, we had a nitro group present on the ring. Okay, so that, that's kind of key for doing this reaction, all right? If that nitro group were not there, this reaction would not occur. Okay, you must have a good leaving group, all right? So notice that in that reaction, the uh, you know the alcohol that we add on substitutes not a hydrogen as we saw in EAS reactions, but instead we're swapping out that bromine, right? So we have bromine there as our leaving group. We need um, you know we need a leaving group like that present uh, for the uh, incoming nucleophile to swap out. Okay. Finally, those two groups, so, so we've, the first two um, requirements we have here involve substituents that should be on our benzene ring. The third requirement is a directional one. We need these two groups to be either ortho or para to each other. Now, why is this? We're going to see in the mechanism, uh, you know, basically look at the intermediates and look at the charges on those intermediates. Okay, so if we start off with our reactant, okay, so we have our two, uh, you know, our two required groups. We have our electron withdrawing nitro group. We have our uh, leaving group. In this example, it's a chlorine. So, and we have them uh, pair to each other, right? We start off with our nucleophilic attack. So we have our nucleophile that comes in, uh, and we have it attacking the site where our leaving group's attached, because eventually we want that to leave. Now, the intermediate we make is called a Meisenheimer complex. Okay, so like a sigma complex, uh, except instead of a positive charge being spread around through resonance, we have a negative charge here. Okay, which again makes sense because we have uh, the nucleophilic attack arrow going this way towards the benzene ring and not to our to an electrophile like we see in EAS reactions. All right, so we have our Meisenheimer complex. Now think about the resonance that we're going to see in that Meisenheimer complex. Okay, so draw all the resonance contributors for this. Okay, so here's what that looks like, right? We start off with that uh, with that uh, negative formal charge over here in the top left. Uh, we have it uh, move uh, down here. It can move over here, and it can also move down to that nitro group. Okay, so again, it's very useful to have that nitro group at that position where it can be involved in that resonance. All right, if that nitro group were in the meta position, uh, the uh, you know negative formal charge that lone pair would skip over it uh, to this uh, para position here, get okay, onto the other, uh, and skip over the other meta position onto the. Uh, ortho position here. So basically, we need that nitro group to be either ortho or para. Okay. All right. So that's how that Meisenheimer complex is stabilized, of course, uh, and therefore that lowers the transition, uh, you know, the potential energy of that transition state, making that pathway more likely. Uh, finally, we have our leaving group leave, and when it leaves, it reestablishes aromaticity to that benzene ring. Okay, so we, we lose our leaving group, 
and uh, now we have our alcohol group there instead of that chlorine. Okay, um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we observe. We we see that if that nitro group were in the meta position, our mysen hybrid complex would be less stable. Okay, and so as a result, there's no reaction. Okay. Um, something that might help to drive the reaction forward um, is, uh, you know, having excess of your nucleophile. But keep in mind that sodium hydroxide, in addition for to hydroxide being a nucleophile, uh, it's also a base, right? So in this case, since we're putting on a an alcohol group and we're making a phenol, uh, remember phenols are pretty acidic. So uh, you know we would wind up with the deprotonated version. Uh, and that's why the second step of the reaction involves adding an acid. And to, that's how we get the protonated version accordingly. So as I pointed out earlier, like, you know, having a, um, you know, a um, electron withdrawing group is kind of important for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, you need, uh, in order to make that ring electron poor enough so that a nucleophile will attack it, uh, you need something to pull that electron density away from it. That being said, um, you know, while you wouldn't expect a uh, you know a benzene without that electron withdrawing group to undergo um, you know an NAS reaction, it is possible to get it to undergo a reaction overall using harsher conditions. Notice that instead of just having this warm at 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, you know, moderately hot, I should say, at 70 degrees Celsius, we have a really high temperature here of 350 degrees Celsius. Um, and so having those harsher conditions does drive this reaction forward and makes that, uh, you know, we s swap out that chlorine for that alcohol group. Okay, so how does that happen? Okay, um, it, by the way, it, it also helps to have a really strong nucleophile in, in this situation. Uh, so, for example, instead of uh, hydroxide, uh, here we've we've got an amide ion, uh, which is very very nucleophilic, right? Very very basic as well, um, you know, really reactive, and uh, so that's why we you know see you know this reaction, the substitution. Now, that being said, all right we don't see one uh, product uh, when we have multiple substituents. So over here with just the benzene and that leaving group, um, it doesn't really matter, you know, where uh, the amine goes, like you only have one product. Uh, but if you try this with toluene, where now there's already a methyl group sticking out there, we observe that there's actually two products that we get. All right, so we see that uh, nitro group where the uh, chlorine was, uh, but we also see the, um, I mean, sorry, not a nitro, that amino group showing up where the chlorine was, but we also see that amino group where, uh, you know, on a carbon adjacent to that, okay, where that leaving group used to be. Okay, so why is that? We can't have it go through our NAS mechanism, right? This doesn't account for why we would see the second product, so it must be another mechanism involved. So if you want to study this mechanism, uh, one way to go about it is to do a labeling experiment. So essentially what you do is you uh, pick a relevant atom um, and you swap it out for a different isotope, uh, one that you can either pick up using that mass spec or, um, or probably at NMR, uh, or it might disappear in NMR. Um, and so we uh, basically can you know, identify where that atom is in our products, and that gives us a little insight uh, into the mechanism that led to that product. So if we do a labeling experiment, let's say we label the carbon where our leaving group's attached uh, with a carbon-14 instead, okay? Um, you know, so... Uh, Basically, we'll see that that carbon, uh, you know, in our products, we have that amine attaching to that carbon, uh, but we also have it at an adjacent carbon. Okay, so it kind of proves again that we can't be going through that NAS reaction, but it does tell us that essentially uh, what's going on is that these two carbons, uh, these two positions must be equivalent somehow. 
So what happens is that we must be going through what's called a benzyne intermediate. We, we have an intermediate uh, that uh, you know, basically has a triple bond. Okay, so what's happening instead of our, uh, you know, our nucleophile coming in, adding on, and then our leaving group leaving, is that we actually have essentially an elimination reaction, right? We have our our uh, nucleophile actually acting as a base here. It deprotonates that uh, position uh, next to where our leaving group is and winds up eliminating the hydrohalogen there. So we have our leaving group leave, we have a uh, hydrogen leave, and you know we basically form another pi bond here. Now, just looking at this, this looks kind of problematic, right? Because uh, think about what you know about alkynes, right? And what you know about sp hybridized carbons. They like to be linear, right? Uh, this is very not linear, so uh, that looks really, really weird. Okay, and that tells us automatically that this benzyne is probably not very stable and therefore pretty reactive. And it's probably going to react rel relatively readily to make our products. Okay, uh, if you want to see understand why, uh, again, those sp hybridized, uh, you know, orbitals can't really uh, overlap very well, uh, and so we essentially have them kind of sticking out. Uh, it's almost like a di radical. Okay. All right, so that being said, uh, it's prone to an attack. It, that nucleophile, we've got the strong nucleophile readily available to attack that very reactive benzyne. And so it doesn't really care which carbon it attacks. It can attack either one, either the isotopically labeled one or an adjacent carbon, right, where, where we have uh, the other end of that triple bond. Okay, and that's how we get our two different products. Okay, so we basically have our uh, nucleophile attack, our um, our alkyne, we result in this resulting anion, which then gets protonated to make the resulting product. Okay. Oh, uh, by the way, please note that uh, you know uh, we had uh, a mean. Uh, we used an amine uh, that uh, amide ion rather twice in this reaction. First, we used it as a base. Secondly, we used it as a nucleophile. All right, so um, even though we have ammonia acting as our acid in this case, uh, please note that we're still using, we had to use two equivalents of, um, of our amide ion to get, and only get one back. So amide's not being regenerated. It's, acting as a, it's not acting as a catalyst here. All right. Um, another uh, piece of evidence to show that we're going through a benzyne intermediate um, is, remember, these benzynes are really reactive. Uh, they readily will undergo a Diels-Alder reaction. All right. So it's, it's a really strong dienophile here. So if you have a, uh, you know, a diene readily available, so here we have furan, for example, uh, note that we have the resulting, um, you know, uh, cycloaddition product. Okay, so how do you figure out what's going on with these three options? We have, uh, you know, our electrophilic aromatic substitution, we have nucleophilic uh, aromatic substitution, and then as we just saw we have an elimination addition reaction. Okay, uh, and oftentimes we have very similar, um, you know, reagents, right? Uh, especially in the case of of our nucleophilic aromatic substitution and elimination addition, right? We, we have really strong nucleophiles there. Uh, how do we distinguish between these? Okay, uh, so first of all, look at your reagents and ask yourself, am I using an electrophile or a nucleophile to do this reaction? Uh, it sounds like a dumb question, but that's obviously the, the big difference between a, an electrophilic aromatic substitution and these other two, which re, re, you know require nucleophiles. To distinguish between those last two reactions, of course, uh, remember nuclear aromatic, uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution had three key requirements. Uh, you need all three of those requirements to be met for it to be a nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, if you don't meet all those three requirements, uh, for example, if you don't have that strongly uh, deactivating group present, 
uh, you're going to go through this alternate mechanism. You're going to go through do an elimination addition instead. All right, and that's it for this chapter. So let's go through these practice problems. Um, but again, like you know, as always, I do recommend uh, trying the suggested problems um, that I've put up on Blackboard. All right, so here we have a benzene, and they've given us our reagents. Let's figure out what the product's going to be. So looking at our reagents, we have a terpyl chloride and an aluminum chloride. Right, so aluminum chloride here is going to act as a catalyst uh, slash Lewis acid catalyst. Um, what type of reaction do these reagents, you know, yield? Okay, so here we have a setup for a Friedel Crafts alkylation. Right, this is the alkyl group we're going to add on, and so here's the complete mechanism. Basically, it reacts with our aluminum chloride, produces this complex, uh, which essentially plucks off the chlorine and produces a stable carbocation. Okay, uh, it's you know possible for our benzene to re react directly with this, but uh, effectively it might be easier to show this as a separate carbocation. Our benzene attacks that, um, and you then have our sigma complex. Of course, this has this is resonance stabilized. We we're only showing the one complex. We're not showing all the resonance structures. Um, and then of course we have our uh, our complex. Um, which can also act as a base, and so it plucks off that extra proton, restoring aromaticity, and there we have our alkyl benzene as the product. Okay, here we have uh, what looks like two near identical reactions, right? So both of these are going to be nitrations, right? We've got concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid. Uh, we're going to basically add a nitro group. The question now becomes, what is the directing effect of these groups? Okay, so while these groups, uh, the, the substituent on these two molecules is has all the same pieces, notice the connectivity is a little different, right? So here we have a nitrogen connected to a carbonyl connected to an alkyl group. Here we have the carbonyl connected to the nitrogen connected to the alkyl group. So here we have the nitrogen connecting to the benzene ring. Here we have the carbonyl connected to the benzene ring. Okay, so ask yourself, are these activating or deactivating groups? Are they going to be ortho-para-directing? Are they going to be meta-directing? Okay, so as soon as you see this nitrogen when it's lone pair attached, you should realize like, okay, this is going to be a uh, an activating group. It's going to be an ortho-para-director. Now, Given the bulkiness of this group, I would say the para position is going to be favored. All right. Uh, now here we have a carbonyl, which again should make you think deactivating group, uh, and that's the case. It's going to be a meta director. So here you can see the nitro group shows up at the para position. Here it shows up at the meta position. All right. Here we have a multi-step synthesis. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit tougher and takes you back to some some concepts from last semester. Um, you know. And so this one's going to take a quite a few steps to to kind of bring things together. Okay, uh, it might be easier to actually do this retrosynthetically. We look at this product and ask ourselves, okay, how do we get these together, right? Uh, so, so you want to consider, you know, basically where is a good site for for this to form? Now here, notice that we have an alcohol group and we have like another, um, you know. Uh, and you know, we have uh, carbons attached to that uh, alpha carbon. Um, I will point out a you know a very useful reaction here to do the setup might be a Grignard reaction, right? So if you had a, if this used to be a carbonyl, uh, it might be uh, you know relatively easy to have an R group, uh, you know, a, a Grignard reagent attack that carbonyl, right? Depending on which way you do this. Um, you know, so, you know, that's just an option. So stop, the, pause this video and see if you can think of any uh, particular ways to, to, to go about this. Okay. All right. So looking at the answer here, right, uh, you can see that we do have uh, two sort of pathways leading to our Grignard reaction. So here we're making our Grignard reagent. Uh, over here we're making uh, the carbonyl that the Grignard attacks. Okay, so both of them start off with a benzene. Um, now here 
we we eventually want our Grignard to be para to that alkyl group. Now the problem with the alkyl group that's on there is that it's a primary alkyl group and we've seen that, that we can't do a Friel Crafts alkylation with a primary alkyl halide. So you actually first have to do an acylation and then do the Clemenson reduction to, to get the resulting um, alkyl group there. Now that alkyl group is going to be ortho para directing. It's a pretty bulky group so it makes sense that that uh, you know your other you're going to get your other substituent para to it. Uh, remember to make a Grignard reagent you've got to uh, you know take an alkyl halide and then react it with magnesium and ether so we need you know if we're doing this retrosynthetically if we want to make this Grignard reagent uh, we have to have a bromine at this position okay so that's why the step over here involves taking that uh, alkyl benzene and then uh, doing a bromination with it before we then convert to a Grignard reagent Okay, uh, over here we can see that we are effectively doing an acylation. Uh, you know, our acyl group here just only has a hydrogen as its R group. Okay, um, and now we have our Grignard reagent, which remember uh, this carbon that our our magnesium is attached to. That's going to be our, where our nucleophile is. That's effectively a carb anion. So that carbon is going to connect to this carbonyl carbon, making this intermediate which we can then protonate to make the final product. All right. Um, so, and, and again, don't panic. That was a very long, complicated uh, reaction, a very long, complicated example. Hopefully you won't see anything uh, that ridiculous on a quiz or exam. Okay, so here's another um, you know, multi-step synthesis problem, except here they're giving you the intermediates um, and they want you to fill in the reagents. Okay, so for each of these steps, look at the reactant it comes from, look at the product, and ask yourself, what reagents do I need? Now, please note that some, in some cases we have multiple substituents added on, um, you know, in each step. So you may have multiple reagents, multiple reactions going on in a given step. Okay, and you might also want to consider order of operations, right? Because uh, you've got to consider the directing effect of those substituents. So again, pause this video and see if you can figure out uh, what reagents go into these five blanks. Okay, so if you've joined us uh, back, uh, here are the answers. All right, so notice that over here to make this product, we have a bromine and we have an alkyl group. Okay. Um, these are both, um, uh, you know, ortho para directing, uh, but so it kind of seems kind of weird that they're meta to each other, right? So that tells us that they probably weren't in their this form when this happened. So how do we get this primary alkyl group on here? Now again, we know that that goes through an acyl intermediate that we can then reduce down to. Uh, the al primary alkyl group. Well, that acyl group is going to be meta directing. So it makes sense that the first step is to add on that acyl group. So we do a Friedel Crafts acylation, okay, with the necessary uh, alkyl group on our acyl chloride uh, to show up here. We then add on our bromine, okay, using our bromine and our either our iron three bromide or aluminium bromide. And it's only then that we reduce our our uh, acyl group down to this alkyl group. Okay, so the order in which we do this is very, very important. If you switch up the order for this, you would, you know, immediately like make uh, an isomer of this that is not the product you want. Okay, so now for reaction B, uh, the difference between this chemical and this chemical is that we have oxidized that benzylic position to carboxylic acid, which if you recall, we can do that with a strong oxidizing agent like potassium permanganate. All right, now looking at this reaction, the difference here is we are adding on a nitro group. So again, the reagent for that is concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid. So that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you want to confirm the directing effects, uh, you want to make sure you remember that this is ortho para directing, this is uh, ortho para directing as well, even though it's deactivating. Uh, so it makes sense that the two sites that are very likely, uh, so basically you could either have, uh, you know, this position, this position, or this position are all, you know, ortho and or para to those groups. 
Um, out of those, it makes sense that the nitro group shows up over here. Um, you know, you definitely don't want it over here where it's in between those two bulky groups. Uh, and out of these two uh, ortho positions, um, while the bromine is pretty bulky, it's smaller than this propyl group. So it makes sense that the nitro group is ortho to it. Okay. Um, so when we look at the reaction here to make D, the difference between these two molecules is that our nitro group's been reduced into an amine. So remember, you can do that with zinc or iron and HCl. So it looks like here they're using zinc, but you could have used iron if you if you use that. That's still correct. Uh, and over here, uh, this one's interesting. We have our bromine swapped out for an ethoxide group. Now, you probably say to yourself, like, wait a minute, I don't remember an uh, EAS reaction that does this. Um, and that tells us that this is probably not an EAS reaction. Uh, this, you know, ethoxide is a nucleophile, right? So we could use sodium ethoxide here as our nucleophile. Uh, we do have a nitro group. Okay, so notice that this molecule meets all three requirements for our, our nucleophilic aromatic substitution. We have a strongly deactivating nitro group, and it is, uh, you know, we have a good leaving group here in this bromine, and notice that the nitro group is ortho to the bromine. Okay, remember, we need the, those two groups to be either ortho or para to each other. In this case, they're ortho. This meets the requirements for an NAS reaction, and that's what happens. We swap out the bromine leaving group for our ethoxide. So again, we need to have our ethoxide in a nucleophilic form here. So we use sodium ethoxide as our nucleophile, okay? Uh, as opposed to like, let's say, ethanol, which would be, a, you know, which is only weakly nucleophilic. All right, that's it for this chapter. Um, so, as always, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, please do try out these practice problems. You can see especially, uh, you know, this, this chapter is very synthesis heavy, uh, and this stuff really comes together with practice. It's very procedural stuff, uh, so, so be sure to try out uh, the homework. All right, uh, good luck with your quiz, and we'll catch you in the next chapter.